Hello. So does anyone else here like going to charity shops or bazaars and buying random stuff? Yes, me too. I love it. In fact, this practice has turned me into a bit of a hoarder. And I'll buy anything, whether it's a weirdly shaped teapot, a praying kneeler, even busts of people whose names I've never heard of. Now, the reason I like doing this is because it, has, um, it gives me the opportunity to get things that other people don't want and to turn them into cherished possessions. And I particularly like doing that with items of clothing and accessories. Now, when we buy these things, we don't just buy the thing. We also buy the story that comes with them. An item of clothing may have been you know, part of someone's dramatic love affair, or maybe it was bought on a whim and left at the back of a wardrobe for many years. Or maybe it was something someone bought in the hopes of passing it on to their children someday. But for one reason or another, they never managed to. This passion for uh, the stories that come with clothes and also of giving clothes new stories started with one item of clothing, and that item of clothing is an onella. Now, for those of you who have never heard of an onella, an onella is a type of headdress that would have been worn by women in Malta in the past. And it would have been ubiquitous. Women would have worn it to go to the shops, to go to mass, practically everywhere. Um, obviously, then in the 1940s and 50s, it went out of use. But everyone in Malta sort of knows about the Onella. And as a collector, or I think I should come clean as a hoarder, I'd always wanted one. So when a friend of mine told me that one of them was for sale, incidentally, at Gigi's Antiques, um, I just had to have it. And I made about a dozen phone calls in 15 minutes, and I managed to get it. Um, um, and I'm really glad I did, because it, it really changed my perspective on fashion and how we can use the past. Now, when I bought it, I had no intention of wearing it, at least not in public anyway. Um, but, <laughs> but then I got thinking, um, what if I did wear it? What if I used this? And I, would, I could show people through it that things that we take for granted one day can completely disappear within a generation. You know, a bit like the beautiful Slimmer townhouses or our once church-dominated skylines or the sturdy rubble walls that line Malta's countryside. So I decided, OK, I'm going to wear it, but I had to confirm one thing, and that is the cultural context in which an onella would have been worn. So I got in touch with fashion historian Caroline Tonna and the then curator of Palazzo Falzon, Francesca Balzan, to ask them a couple of questions, mainly, was the onella a religious symbol? Was it a classist thing? Was it only women of a certain class who would have worn it? And was it oppressive? They confirmed to me that it wasn't any of those things. All women wore it. Um, and so I decided to go for it. I paired mine with a black uh, suit, a brown velvet bow tie, a cameo brooch, and um, a pair of pink velvet sunglasses I picked up for a fiver. As an aside, when I sent this photo to my mother, her only comment was, the glasses are a bit extra. I mean, I thought, <laughs> you know, I thought the whole thing was extra, but OK. <laughs> um, anyways, I wore this to the Malta Fashion Awards 2018. And um, the reception was electrifying. People wanted to try it on. They wanted to uh, take photos of it and of me wearing it. I think some people thought I had accidentally gone to the awards when I was meant to be at Heritage Malta site on, on my shift. But I'm also sure that a lot of people thought it was very cool. And in fact, the Sonella has had quite a neat life ever since that night. It's been featured in multiple magazines, including Puspus Puss magazine in the UK. Um, this is a photo shoot by Stephanie Gallia. And even more recently, it was measured and photographed by artist Anna Gallia, who sent that information to leading Emirati artist Adza El Kubaisi who then used it to combine the Maltese Onnella with the Arab Abaya to create a life-sized steel sculpture um, that symbolizes femininity, the womb, and womanhood. This sculpture is currently exhibited at the Dubai 2021 Expo, so that's quite cool. Um, of course, seeing the way people reacted to my Onnella outfit, I was quite emboldened to try other things and to bring in more historical elements into my personal style. And the outfit I'm going to share with you next was inspired by a painting. 
Um, the painting is called um, The Rainbow Portrait, and it was painted in 1600, and it depicts Queen Elizabeth I of England. Now, there's a lot going on here. The hair, the jewels, the rainbow in her hand that's a bit faded, but it's meant to symbolize that she's brought peace to her kingdom. Obviously, all propaganda, no doubt about that. But it doesn't change that what she's wearing is really intriguing. The bodice, which is the cream garment, is, has um, gold and silver thread, and it depicts the flora and the fauna she would have had on her vast estates. But then there's the orange garment, the overgarment. Do you notice anything peculiar about it? Yes, there are eyes and ears depicted on it, and that's nothing supernatural. Basically, the message there is the queen can see and hear everything um, her subjects would have, would, would have said and done. Sorry. When I found out about the symbolism, I was enthralled, and I had to somehow recreate some of the elements from it. And being a hoarder, which I've already confessed to, and knowing some really good artists here in Malta, I had the perfect centerpiece. This brooch, which is coming up, is called Widnet El Bahar, and its symbolism is very different to the rainbow portrait. Basically, this is a play on words. Widnet El Bahar is Malta's national plant, and its name directly translates to ear of the sea. This is the ear of the sea. But it's an ear, and it worked so well for the outfit, I just had to use it. To it, I added red velvet ribbons and uh, strings of pearls and also an orange sash um, to capture some of the colors from the rainbow portrait. And I fashioned a ruff from 100-year-old Maltese lace, which had never been used for anything before. This is the result, which was quite Baroque, quite pretty in my opinion, and it was way too warm to be worn in autumn here in Malta. Um, but this was a fashion show in Gozo, a Luca Zapardi fashion show. Um, it was seven o'clock at night. I was already there. I had nothing else to wear, so I just had to do it. And I gl I'm glad I did because the thought process that brought me to this outfit has inspired many more after it. In fact, two years ago, I worked with the great designers at Camilleri Paris Mode on one inspired by Henry VIII. Um, it's a simple concept, it's just a blazer and a pair of trousers, obviously, but the rich fabric, the colors, those shoulders, I mean, they scream power. I felt I had been doing bench presses for 10 years rather than eating chicken nuggets, which is what I've actually been doing. Um, but as you can see today, I don't go around dressed like I'm about to co-star in a Kira Knightley movie. Um, instead, what I try to do is subtly include elements from history and art. So, when I was trying to channel a Regency dandy look, what I did was I put up my shirt collar and I replaced the tie or bow tie with um, a silk scarf. I then put on a pair of 1970s aviators because I have no problem mixing eras whatsoever. And I topped it all off with a very special brooch. Now, this brooch is by Francesca Balsan. As, as you can see, on one end, there's a portrait of Louis XIV. And on the other hand, the, well, on the other end, there's a hand. If that hand looks familiar, it's because it's a detail from a very famous painting at the Louvre called Gabrielle Destre and one of her sisters. Apparently, this is what she used to do to her sister. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yes, fashion and history can be fun. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it makes it cool. Then when I was trying to go for a 1920s look, I basically put on a black suit, a rough my father wore to his wedding in the 1970s and a telescopic cigarette holder I had got from Turkey, I think, I can't remember. Obviously, smoking is bad for you, and I'm not telling you you should do it, you shouldn't. But the point here is that a small accessory can truly change your outfit. So when we talk about including elements, it doesn't have to be something major. It can be something small. But of course, if you want to go for major, go for it. I love it, and in fact, I love capes. Um, this look at Sopardi Cape, I wore it to a pink fashion show about three and a half, four years ago, and I love it. A, I felt like Batman in it, and B, it's so dramatic and it keeps you warm. I think we really should bring them back. The last two outfits I want to share with you are quite plain by my standards, I don't know if you think so too. Um, but I included these not because there's anything major in them, but because I just picked up different brooches from different eras, made from different materials, metal, ceramic, felt, um, more silver filigree, and um, 
I basically visually balance them on my outfit to give it some character. When I feel like my outfit doesn't have enough character, I put on a brooch, which is what I did today. Um, so basically, what doing all this has taught me is that things from the past, whether they're accessories or clothes, or things, even things inspired by the past, can be just as cool, just as versatile, just as interesting as modern fashion. But if you opt for older things, there are even more benefits. They're more environmentally friendly, they're normally cheaper because they're secondhand, and you'll always have a conversation starter. So if, like me, you find it a little bit difficult to start a conversation, someone will approach you and talk to you about it. So I hope you will consider trying it out yourself. Thank you.